Um, so John Dewey, I haven't shown you this one yet, have I? Here? I get so confused because I actually showed these slides at the Media Lab on Monday. I couldn't come to Jerry Sussman's talk because I had to lecture at the Media Lab. Um, the great scientific revolution is still to come. It will ensue when men systematically use scientific procedures for the control of human relationships and the direction of the social effects of our vast technological machinery. The story of the achievement of science and physical control is evidence of the possibility of control in social affairs. So, um, 1931. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys think that you know systematically using scientific procedures for the control of human relationships is a good idea or a bad one. <laughs> So I think, I think what he was getting at um, was that potentially if you have computers mediating people's interactions that you have the possibility of um, getting help from those machines. So let me give you a couple examples. One, I think it was McKinsey, one of the management consulting firms. They surveyed their employees and they asked people, uh, who are you mentoring right now? So they wrote down all those relationships and then uh, they asked uh, people, who's mentoring you? And they wrote all of those relationships down, and they turned out, turned out there was very little correspondence. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ask yourself on photo.net, for example, what if we had a computer-mediated mentoring system? We have the possibility, at least, of scientific procedures controlling that human relationship, in other words, saying, okay, once a week we're going to send a report to the people who are mentoring, showing, saying, hey, you haven't even talked to your mentees this week. Um, you know, maybe you should check in with them. They have these three outstanding questions. And that's just not possible to do when all interaction happens face to face with no computer mediation. Another example is a telephone system, Wildfire, that was developed about 10 years ago. And if you're talking on the phone, Wildfire's always listening. And if you say Wildfire, she wakes up and says, here I am. And then you can say, can you please conference in um, my mom. And Wildfire knows your mom's phone numbers. She can try the various ones. Uh, if she can find your mom, then she bridges her into the existing call. So that's much more powerful than a regular phone connection. Uh, and again, it's because you have this scientific procedure controlling the uh, human relationship of the phone call. So I think I'm not sure John Dewey was envisioning online communities per se uh, back in 1931, but I think the online community is a good example of what he was talking about. Um, so this gets us back into, you know, internet to some extent is a control mechanism, technological control mechanism for human relationships. Has it been good or bad? Um, so there's a study from Stanford sociologists at Stanford did a study and did a fancy press release and they gave web TV to a few thousand households and then they measured what happened. So they found out that email and reference library were the number one uses. People use the internet to talk to other people and to answer questions. Um, chat was only used by young people. Business to consumer activity was very slight. So people didn't use it to buy stuff. Um, the sociologist said that people who use the internet lost contact with their offline social environment, worked more, and abandoned traditional media. So Amitai Etzioni, who's the world's leading communitarian, he's a sociologist at George Washington University, and he's been studying this stuff for about 40 years, mostly in the context of traditional communities. He said, well, actually, if you look at the data, they show that you know, 86 and 7 percent of the people uh, reported that there was no change in the amount of time they spent with their friends and family. So actually the conclusion should have been internet does not affect social life significantly. Uh, the things that were cut into were really watching TV and shopping and the heavier the users, <laughs> the less, uh, the more it cut into watching TV and shopping. That's true. Um, so Etzioni would say, well, the Internet's, you know, it does change our lives, but 
the evidence that it socially isolates people is pretty poor. A lot of people say the internet and email have made people uncivil. So Etzioni complained about the Stanford guys and said their conclusions were wrong. Um, he didn't argue with their data. So, the, so one thing people complain about the internet, they say it makes people uncivil. So here Etzioni complains about their internet study. They say sometimes ideological or methodological prejudice gets in the way of sound judgment and even common sense. Perhaps this is what happened to our colleague, Amitai Etzioni, who, in the sunset of a distinguished <laughs> career, <laughs> goes on. <laughs> So there may be some evidence there on that one. Um, I, showed you, uh, the AO I showed you the AOL LISA thing yesterday, didn't I? No, no, you no I did show it to you. What? Are you sure? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we saw a link to it. <laughs> yeah, well. You pointed out a link to it. But then the thing that uh, creates uh, artificial chat conversations I, I, I did show it to you. No, 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 no. You showed us the page. All right. Yeah. You saw this in some class. You saw this in my one day course. So this is 58. <laughs> you know, Liza says, What seems to be your problem? 58 says, You know, 58 is the anonymized AOL user, so, it, you know, it's a human. Just looking for random people to talk to. Tell me more about that. I like to talk to random people from all around. It is fun. But enough about me. Let's talk about you. Tell me more about that. <laughs> Let's talk about you. Where do you hail from? You're not really talking about me, are you? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Please go on. Anyway. Um, I came to you looking for a random person to chat to. Does this make you feel unhappy? And I ended up with an, and I ended up with an interesting person, to say the least. <laughs> Why do you say you ended up with an interesting person? Trying to get you to say anything about yourself is like kicking dead whales down a beach in Nebraska. In what way? Um, yes, it does. Bye for now. Please go on. End. Does talking about this bother you? See ya. Please go on. Maybe later. I'm not sure I understand you fully. If you message me again today without, messaging, without me messaging you first, I'll warn you. What does the speculation lead to? It leads to a 5% warning level. <laughs> um, so that was uh, a 1966 program called ELISA and a Perl version of ELISA, a Mac with nothing better to do than play psychoanalysts, a few Apple scripts and an AOL, a an AIM account that has a high rate of random people trying to start conversations. So that is something that we will get to. That is a conversation that became uncivil. Um, but in the meantime, let's think of something good about online communities. Um, let's think first about your friends. And we talked about this yesterday, right? Did we, did we talk about this Monday? Weak ties? Yeah. So um, the online community creates a lot more weak ties, uh, opportunities to teach. Um, Let's look, at, though, at what are the required elements. Let's look at this in more detail. Uh, we looked at this a little bit the other day. Magnet content authored by experts. So on photo.net, I'll show you the Nikon D1 review that I just did. So this is you know, not really careful, but it does enable me to collect comments from the users. It serves as a magnet. I only use the camera for about two and a half weeks. I said that it was pretty painful to use. Notice that there's about half, there's about as many comments as what I wrote. That's a pretty typical ratio. Uh, the more you write, the more comments you'll get. If you don't write anything, um, you won't get any interesting comments because just like you can't stop any, somebody in the street and say, tell me something interesting, you have to give them something to react to. That's the way the human mind works. So the more you give them to react to, the more that you'll get. Um, so here's an expert user. He says, actually, you only get the full quality of D1 photos in the raw format. And uh, you shouldn't use JPEG. He's probably quite right. So that's a pretty thoughtful comment. Here's a guy, Jim Tardio. I guess Nikon figures that people who use this camera would actually take the time to learn how to operate it before lugging it around the world. 
Shame on them for not making the manual reviewable at internet cafes. What nerve! <laughs> so you can actually see how unqualified this guy is to comment by his, his later comment here. To be fair, I completely agree with Philip's observations. When I first picked this thing up in the store, I knew it was far too complicated for me to enjoy. By the time I pressed the right buttons, the picture would be gone. <laughs> so here he reveals that he couldn't figure out how to use it either, and that he's never actually used the camera, yet he's commenting. So that pretty much sucks to get comments like that, but you can moderate them out. But you do get occasionally, here's a comment from a guy who actually did a photo shoot. Here in Milan, we use the D1. After 60 shots, we notice the same spotting problem. You get dust inside. If you change the lenses on a regular Nikon and some dust gets in the camera, it falls onto the film. You get dust on one frame. In a digital camera, you change the lens. Some dust blows in, lands on the CCD. You lock the lens back up. You now get dust on your next thousand pictures um, until you notice and take the camera to be professionally clean. So anyway, during the two days we had to continue shooting. Oh yes, the D1 is still a little rare in Italy, so we had to wait two days to get a replacement D1. The shop that sold it didn't know how to clean it or didn't have the tool. It actually, to, to, to sort of kick the mirror up, it says that you need this optional AC adapter. So, which, you know, if you're in Agra, India, that's not a good thing to be reading. <laughs> a lot of other comments. Somebody found a great review, interview with Jay Meisel, who's a commercial photographer um, who uses the D1. And uh, here's a guy who says, I regret every shot I took using JPEG instead of the RAW format. So, very useful. For somebody who's going to rent a D1, this turns out to be a lot more useful than it would have been without that means of collaboration at the bottom. But I wouldn't have gotten those comments if I hadn't, uh, if I hadn't uh, written the magnet content to begin with. Q&A forum, you've seen this pretty much ad nauseum. Um, I did just get a, I do think it's a good thing though. Um, what is the best film? One kind of advantage that I claim for this forum is that you can ask a question and, and you get all the answers on one page just by scrolling down. So there's much less UI machinery than there is in other kinds of Q&A forums on the web, typically. So Alan Cooper, thoughtful UI guy, says no matter how good your user interface, it would be better if there were less of it. So I think that applies here. Powerful facility for browsing and searching. Magnet content and contributed content. So let's say we go to photo.net and there it is. Um, we say, I want to buy a Hasselblad or a Rolly. Did I show you this example? No. Okay. So you're about to spend $20,000 on one of these two cameras and lenses. You want to know which, one's, which is the right one. So you could just go and ask the question, click on ask a question. The problem with that is if that behavior is common, it wears out the moderators in the community to keep seeing the same questions over and over again. So you need a, a way for people to quickly search. Now every publisher pretty much has this these days, search the articles that they've published. But if you don't have, none of these are really on point as much as um, which one? Hasselblad versus Rolleiflex. So basically, you want a system that can search very seamlessly, very easily, both the magnet content and the user contributed content, so that you don't get too many dupes. Question? Um, the numbers on the left are they a relevance rating? If so, they are in a. Oh, they're. I don't know. Pulled, pulled out of the full text search software. In this case, it happens to be um, the Oracle text feature. One of the nice things about Oracle, one of the most critical elements of any web service is full text indexing. And one of the nice things about Oracle is that um, it includes a built-in full text search engine that used to be called Intermedia. They kept renaming it because it wasn't working very well. Um, so they hoped that people would forget all the bugs. I think now they're calling it Oracle Text, but it was Intermedia Text until very recently. And in your docs, I think it's called Intermedia Text. So Intermedia Text is cool because it can just take all the text in an Oracle table and index it. And um, then as you add and delete stuff, the index gets updated automatically. 
Um, you might say, well, I thought that's what I was getting with a database was indexing. Well, with most databases, uh, you only get indices that are B tree indices on you know, short keys and tables. You can't index full documents. And you only get um, the index is only useful if you're querying on the first word in a sentence. It's not useful to uh, find something that's buried inside a document or to do things like stemming. So if you search for you know, the word running, it also, uh, if, you were, if you search for the, the word, um, yeah, running, it uh, also matches uh, something like, uh, you know, the uh, Boston Marathon, can, you know, had a lot of runners today. So running and runners stem down to the same root, and uh, full text search engines are smart enough to figure that out. So Oracle has this thing called Intermedia. It's cool for that reason. It's also nice because it understands weird binary formats. So you can give it. Uh, in the RS Digital Community System file storage system, for example, you can upload a text document, an HTML document, a Microsoft Word document, a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, uh, a PDF document, a PostScript document, and a JPEG photo. And Intermedia will come roaring through, index the text, index the HTML doc. It can index the Word document, and on demand, it can serve you an HTML version of the Word document for people who don't have H who don't have uh, Word. It can rip the text out of the Excel spreadsheet and index that. It's, can, it's smart enough to figure out that the JPEG file isn't worth indexing and that it's just a photo, so it ignores that. Uh, so that's the second cool thing about Intermedia. It also has a few modes, like it can go out and search stuff over the web. If you're using Postgres, you're screwed. <laughs> no, you're not screwed, but if you want to have full text indexing, what you're going to have to do is what people used to do 10 years ago, which is every night you have a script that copies everything out of your database, dumps it into the Unix file system, and then you run some kind of old-style text search engine over the files in the file system, um, one of which is uh, PLS, which is pretty good. It's not open source, but it's free. And there's probably some open source ones as well. But it gets to be kind of a maintenance hassle because you have two copies of all of your data. And also, your full text index is going to lag uh, by some amount of time your uh, Oracle uh, your canonical relational database tables. So good luck. <laughs> um, actually, one of the coolest things about oops, the first database that I used was, or the second database that I used was called Illustra, which was a commercialized version of Postgres. And one of the nicest things about it was <coughs> that it was one of the first databases that had tightly integrated full text search. Okay, means of delegation and moderation. I don't think I showed you the admin pages behind photo.net, did I? So there's a couple things that we found. One is that experienced users, experienced users weren't that problematic. It was the new users that we had to look at. So in other words, somebody who's been using the service for a year, it wasn't really worth wasting our time looking at what they had been contributing, because it was probably more or less on topic probably adhered to the norms of the community. On the other hand, people who just registered could be very confused, submit stuff that was off topic. So let's look. Unfortunately, this is not as good as it used to be as a demo, because my four friends who are, have taken over photo.net are actually doing moderation. So I used to be able to find really bad stuff and nuke it in real time. But let's see if there's anything. So there's 40 new ads from the new users. There's about 1,000 people who have registered recently. We can go back between 1 and 30 days. Look at this UI here. It's just like a slider. If this were uh, in Java, it would be done as a little slider knob. But to implement it just as um, HTML, we've you know, let you pick discrete points along the dimension. So you can go back from one day all the way up to 30 days. You can go from new users or slide over to all users. I think that's a good UI trick. So basically, instead of giving people a pre page that has all their choices. Do you want to look at all users for seven days? Do you want to look at new users for 14 days? Which do you want to do? And then offering them the results. Offer them something reasonable, and then let them adjust the data to suit their needs. Um, so I think that's a powerful idea that you guys might want to copy. Uh, they've uploaded 1,000 photos. Those probably do bear looking at, but I don't have the time. Um, reviews of camera stores. Buy right digital, another scam artist, do not deal with them. Uh, down east images. So here's the related links. 
okay, here's a guy who's placed a comment, a related link on the terms of use. So I think the photo.net terms of use really doesn't need nature and wildlife images. It's not a related link to some random legal crud page. So probably the terms of use page. So we can charge him for spamming. Well, spamming's a little rich. Well, why not? So let's delete him. He's foreign, so he probably didn't understand. But anyway, uh, he's a new user, like I said. He's foreign, so he doesn't understand that, you know, uh, nature photography is not related to some garbage that the photo.net lawyers crocked up. Um, now he's been recorded as a spammer, and if this keeps up, eventually he'll float to the top of problematic users that are chewing up a lot of admin effort. Does he um, read, we can ban him. No. No. <laughs> it's secret. No, we have files on him now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, notice these pull down menus. You guys think those are cool? Ari implemented those for Caltech, uh, just like the Macintosh. To give you an idea of um, how tough a problem some programmers have of thinking about publishing and editing. Um, so these are also on photo.net. If we go uh, to the main user pages. When the font's blown up huge, they do tend to be sort of uh, unusable. Oh, well, I guess it's not so bad. But those aren't on all browsers, are they? We disable it for Netscape because Netscape's so broken it can't really interpret JavaScript without crashing, or HTML for that matter. But uh, <laughs> we try to keep Netscape from crashing by eliminating this. But IE does a reasonable job, although it's a little bit slow. It slows things down a bit. I have mixed opinions about this. It may not have been such a great idea. But why Kit, this MIT master's kid who works on photo.net, um, smart guy, well-educated computer scientist, worked in a management consulting firm. He said, we can't use these on photo.net. I said, why not? He said, we have too many articles. They won't all fit on the pull-down menus. I said, well, you have to choose. He said, how can I choose? I said, you have to read the articles and decide which ones you like the best. And that's a whole new idea to him, that you could read n things and choose n over 3. <laughs> so keep that in mind as you go through your programming life, that uh, ultimately websites live or die by editing and somebody having an opinion. OK, so you see basically here on one page, even though Photodot, that's a pretty active site, I have a feeling that anybody here in this room could get through this page in about half an hour and see if things were reasonable, delete the things that weren't reasonable, and uh, move on with their life. So it's only by making it easy for one person that you enable the creation of moderately popular non-commercial online communities. Because as soon as you need a person to work on it full time, you need to get banner advertising and revenue somehow to pay that person. So only by having things that can be administered casually or by volunteers can you... Uh, that's a site-wide. That's only for uh, site-wide administrators. So we also have volunteers to moderate particular forums. So here's a forum where we say, show me the people who have posted <coughs> 75 times in, say, the last uh, month, a few months. So these are people that we could say, well, you're coming to the forum all the time anyway. Why not come through the admin interface and uh, take on some, we should probably read what they've written first, take on some moderation burden. Um, and generally, this does correlate. Almost all of these people are quite good photographers and provide good answers and are pretty sensible people. So probably, um, I don't know, two-thirds or three-quarters of these folks I wouldn't mind having as moderators. And you know, maybe half of those would agree to moderate. So you know, they don't have to put in any specific amount of work. So that's a fourth element, means of delegation to moderation. If you can't delegate moderation, I don't believe that you can be successful in the long, long run. If you have a small non-commercial thing, you'll be forced into commercialization as one person has to work full time. If you have a big commercial thing, you know, one or two employees will become at a bottleneck and keep the community from growing. Means of identifying members who are burdening the community. You need some way of kicking out the troublemakers, because the troublemakers chew up a lot of moderation time. Um, 
There's ways to do this. You can ban them actively. If it's a public community, though, they may be able to come back in disguise. Um, you can try to have the site pretend to be broken. I used to do this. I used to pretend that, there, that we were running Microsoft SQL Server and that this, the database was deadlocked whenever one of the uh, banned users would come. So we would just, you know, say, trying to insert your content in the database, call the sleep function for 15 seconds, print out failed, trying again, call sleep function for 10 seconds, print out failed, to simulate, you know, somebody reading. And remember, in SQL Server, so I, think, I hope you guys have read the book. Anybody here read the book? <laughs> so as I mentioned, in SQL Server, some marketing guy is running a two-hour uh, user activity report. Um, for those two hours, nobody's going to be able to update the database, like place, uh, or anyway, the tables and rows and pages touched. So you know, people might not be able to place comments or register or place orders. So we would simulate that behavior. I think if you're a good programmer, it'd be better to just personalize every page, take the difficult user's con comments, put them into the database, but only show them to them. So personalize your queries so that um, basically you're querying content only from non-difficult users um, union the logged in user. Um, means of software extension by community members themselves. We talked about this before. Um, you know, some way for a person who's not a great programmer but does have great ideas to contribute to the way the software works and flows. Okay, the sociologist, as we noted yesterday, I think, Monday, measure, you need a web of relationships, not just one-to-one. -one. Oh, I guess we haven't gone through this. A measure of commitment to a set of shared values, norms, and meetings, and a shared history. Access, people have to get to each other. This is what you need to have any kind of community, these three things, according to the sociologists. So, um, AOL Instant Messenger by itself doesn't make a very good community. That's what you could learn from uh, this first uh, observation, although I guess they've added chat recently, so maybe um, that needs to be changed. Commitment to a set of shared values, norms, and meetings. <clears throat> I just got email from a lawyer. That's always disturbing, but it turned out to be some lawyer who liked, he corrected something I wrote him. One of my uh, how to read legal citations pages, and uh, he said he really loved my site because, first of all, he liked the way the comments were displayed in line, but also he liked the way that on photo.net people weren't just flaming at each other, they had useful things to say. And he contrasted that with Yahoo, and he said that Yahoo sucks for that reason, all the Yahoo stuff really sucks. Well, I think that the reason that Yahoo um, probably doesn't get a good community going is that they want to be um, Catholic. They want everybody on the internet to come and use Yahoo, regardless of what their beliefs and tastes and um, norms are and their values. And so they don't want to publish anything that might discourage people from using it, since they're aiming to be a universal service. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that is the people that they therefore collect really don't have anything in common. They don't share a commitment to anything. Even on photo.net, you might say, OK, they all share a commitment to photography. But actually, because there's enough content in there about how photography should work, how you should look at the light first, and then maybe uh, the perspective, and then maybe the film, and then only finally the camera, that's completely different from most photography textbooks, which start off with pick a camera, and then you know, maybe pick some film, and, uh, and then maybe pick a lens, and then, I don't know, think about lighting at the end as a detail. So people who don't agree with this approach to considering the making of photographs they probably have left photo.net before they even registered and became part of the community. So by definition, the people who are there, by and large, agree on some of the stuff that uh, has been published at photo.net. Um, access, people get to each other. That's pretty easy to achieve with any kind of computer system. Bonds of affection rather than pure instrumentality. OK, so people can't just be using each other. They have to want to help each other. Etzioni says that overly bonded societies are bad as well. All right, let's look at a brand new question. Widest lens that can be used on a Takahara? Uh, it's not very good. View camera case. Thanks in advance for your help. So he's pretty cordial. John, addressed by first name. There appears to be some affection here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. Uh, Is that Michael? <laughs> Wow, thanks for all your help. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I really like it. 
Anyway, there you have it. There's my banner idea at the bottom. I decided to start, instead of having banner ads at the top, I would crud up my services, free services for other people by sticking banner ideas at the bottom where you get a little photo and uh, intro to a text that they could then read elsewhere. Um, Etzioni would say that the good community also requires exclusion, something that I noticed on photo.net. I just, I didn't think about it, I just noticed that about half of my moderation time was being devoted to dealing with 1% of the users. So I thought, well, if I get rid of these 1% of the users, I can have twice as large a community with the same amount of time. But apparently it's a well-known sociological principle. Okay, so what do people complain about? Online is anonymous, it's inauthentic, and it's uncivil. So the AOL ISA session that we saw earlier was certainly anonymous. It was definitely inauthentic, because 58 thought he was talking to a person, an interesting, what did he say, like you're a really interesting person or something? <laughs> um, and uh, it became uncivil at the end. How do you address those complaints? Well, Etzioni has written about this also in a paper that I referenced, but you can, I've summarized it here. Computer-mediated communities have better access. Face-to-face -face is better in that it can arise serendipitously from a class, for example, from another activity. Face-to-face -face is automatically authenticated. So, you know, if I tell you um, that I'm a 13-year-old girl, you're not going to believe me, probably, because you have some evidence, visual <laughs> evidence, that that's not true. Uh, with a computer-mediated community, you have to work at it. And uh, Etzioni would say that AOL is the worst possible um, way to create a community. That if you have screen names and people aren't authenticated, they may not even be identified in certain places. I guess there may be are completely anonymous areas as well. Uh, and they're not really accountable that uh, you really don't have a good opportunity for forming a community out of an aggregate. So on photo.net, we encourage people to use their real names and authenticate them with reasonable email addresses as opposed to Hotmail. We tend to nuke users. If users say something inflammatory and they're using an obviously fake name, we just delete them from the system altogether. And generally they do, probably they don't come back in most cases. We've had a few persistent ones where we've had to block off IP addresses and things. Um, and we make photo.net users accountable by hyperlinking their name to a complete history of everything they've ever said on the site. So I think that keeps people from saying things that you know, they don't want to stand by. Computer mediated communities are better at supporting broadcast communication that forms and sustains shared bonds and values. So I was able to send you, all of you guys um, a uh, note yesterday uh, very easily and um, about Oracle documentation and so forth. Uh, that's harder in a face-to-face. -face. You have to schedule a town meeting of some sort. But the town meeting is much better at getting an audience reaction. So basically, you know, if you go up to New Hampshire and you speak at a town meeting up there and you advocate, you know, I think guns are bad and smoking is bad and, you know, people should really, um, you know, have somebody like Michael Dukakis to guide them into the correct forms of social behavior. Uh, and you had planned a one-hour speech on that subject of how great you know, Michael Dukakis' government was. Um, probably about five minutes into your talk, you discovered that the people at the town meeting really didn't uh, agree with these ideas, and you choose to speak about something else. Um, whereas if you sent that to a mailing list of you know, all New Hampshire residents, you know, give up your guns, stop smoking. Actually, I think it's a little bit unfair. They do have the highest cigarette sales of any state, but I think a lot of it is because People go across the border from Massachusetts to buy. But they shouldn't have guns, I think. Uh, you shouldn't live free or die. Uh, once you've sent it out, it's too late. You know, so it might be nice to have a computer mechanism whereby maybe a few percent, a random sample of those people could be contacted, uh, that you could get their feedback, and then you know, maybe 24 hours later, you could close the loop up and have it sent to the rest, if nothing really dramatic uh, came back. Face-to-face -face supports break out and reassemble more naturally. If you go to a physical conference, people have coffee breaks and lunch and dinners and so forth where they can talk in smaller groups. Electing a politician, then convicting the criminal. Um, all these things take a lot of time in our society. Um, seems pretty sluggish. But in the computer-mediated community, stuff like that can happen within minutes. 
Uh, you certainly, you can put a discussion forum posting in within a fraction of a second. The question is, is that a good thing? On a lot of these communities like Yahoo and community.cnn.com where people don't seem to get along, part of the reason they're not getting along, I think, is that they're slamming each other. It's not fun to slam somebody if your comment goes into a 24-hour holding tank and it might not even show up interleaved with the person that you're slamming. You can't say, that poster below is a pinhead because now you're like having to reference it. So that would discourage, I think, just by itself putting in some delay on these political discussion forums would probably um, get rid of, I don't know, maybe uh, half of the totally worthless content and let the thoughtful ideas bubble up to the surface. OK, so that's what it. Um, there's a question. This is, I think, pretty relevant to us here because we have these boards. Bulletin boards are basically never used um, because we have all we have the ultimate face to face right. because we're all here. So does that mean face to face supplement? Uh, does it uh, does it replace the computer medi mediated? Process? That's what you have. You have that as an option. Well, we shouldn't. You shouldn't ask me to not go to the next slide because <laughs> the next slide is is uh, first of all we reference a Harvard paper about how Harvard's decided that distance learning per se is bogus and the right thing to do is um, have people meet for a week face to face and then go off once they know each other and uh, interact with a computer mediated system and then come back to reassemble face to face and then go off again. So they basically said that that's probably um, the truly vibrant online communities. If you want a sure way of getting them started, the best way to do that is uh, to start off with some face to face stuff. And Siemens also, when we put the knowledge management system, which we'll see in a minute, into Siemens, they spent a lot of money on what they called training. So they had uh, training sessions in Portugal, South Africa, and somewhere in Asia um, for these salespeople. In, uh, they had 20,000 salespeople in 35 countries. They never met each other before face-to-face. -face. They had this budget. It was easy to sell. They needed training on this new information system. And we laughed at them because they're just running the Photo.net software. So. You know, if all the Photo.net users could figure it out, why would their users need training? But actually, what I think they were doing, they were smarter than we thought, and smarter than us, I guess, uh, in that they realized that for these people to really share with each other, to answer each other's questions, to have some affection for each other, they'd have to meet face to face first. So, yeah, so you might find those discussion forums more active after you graduate. Making sure users can find the discussion. So let me show you this World Bank site. I'll tell you about a technical, well, a UI discussion that I had with them and lost. I lose most debates, but that's OK, I guess. Um, here's their knowledge development gateway. It's a knowledge sharing system. It's not launched yet. It's hard for you to tell whether this is launched or not. Looks fairly complete. If you want to see. Questions. Um, each topic page is a section called Ask the Community. Where are the users? It's sort of hard to tell what people are talking about at this site right now. You can click down into Food Security. You could place comments on things, but in general, community contributions. I don't know, questions and answers, there aren't any. You have to do quite a that's just in food security. Maybe people are really talking a lot about cultural tourism. Oh, that's somewhere else. Anyway, you get the idea. A lot of clicking around. Um, let's compare that to Slashdot. We did look at, actually, we did look at this on Monday, didn't we? Not no? Slashdot. Yeah, so Slashdot, <laughs> I get so confused between the Media Lab and here. Um, look at slash dot. What are people talking about? Well, they're talking about this. They're talking about open courses at MIT. This is kind of interesting. This is actually, I think you guys have had some influence on MIT, oddly enough, because I don't know, Hal and I have been sort of talking about it for a while, and then um, the ADU uh, site came up and running with all these curricular materials. So I think these sorts of things help convince people at MIT that it wouldn't be too hard to have it's on the front page of the New York Times today. I have a server where uh, all MIT courseware and videotapes were deposited. Um, anyway, the article is a little short on details, probably because there aren't many yet. 
but there's an MIT fact sheet that has more information. Um, anyway, if it's not on this list, so you remember they were talking about the ADU uh, mutilation, <laughs> the disfigurement of ADU. Um, but they're not talking about it anymore. You don't have to wonder, are they still talking about that? The answer is no. If it's not on the front page. It's not being discussed. It's lashed out right now. So that's good and it's bad. At least you can find the people. Photo.net. You want to find the new questions? Click on Medium Format Digest and then back up. Click on Nature Photography and then back up. Click on Photo Critique and then back up. So after 12 clicks, you get some perspective. Why not program it so you get a unified presentation? This is what I tried to get the World Bank to do. Come up with some page that contained comments from every different area. So here you see a posting from medium format, some photo critique postings, a nature photography posting. As you see, photo critique, remember we talked about yesterday about how face-to-face -face courses had a heavy critique element? And it turns out that you know, it overwhelmingly dominates the uh, site. So anyway, not too hard to program. They said, Philip, that's a totally bad idea. People who are interested in food security aren't interested in cultural tourism. They don't want to be distracted. I said, well, if they don't want to be distracted, let them customize this you know, to kill off Costa Rica, to kill off medium format digest, uh, to kill off the topics they're not interested in, kill off food security. But at least start them out that way so they get a feel that the community has a lived in, to give the community a lived in look. People have spent a lot of time contributing to things over the years, communities that didn't take off. Um, Rewarding users for participation. Let me show you this ShareNet system at Siemens. This is a knowledge management system. And like I said, this went from 0 to 10,000 users very, very quickly. So they did some things right. One of the things they did right was reward people. They came up with an elaborate system. Answer an urgent question, get 8 points. Answer a regular question, get 4 points. Publish a knowledge object get 10 points. Get a lot of points, get, uh, go to this uh, you know, sales, I don't know, the top 50 people all got flown to Hawaii to hang out for a week together. So, um, and maybe they get some public recognition as well. Amazon did something a little bit similar. Man, that's pokey. So if you look for, uh, let's see if my review of the history of India book is up yet. Uh, okay, India a history. No. Um, all right. How about old Raskin? So this is a book about usability, how to make more usable computer systems. And where is my review? Outside the box isn't the same thing as good. <laughs> That's not mine, though. Forgettable and ineffective. Phil G. Mr. Happy. Um, there are so many books like this one that get written, and yet hard to use computer systems are still produced. I actually had forgotten that I read it. Somebody told me to look at this chapter, and I was reading it the first few pages, and then I had a sense of deja vu all over again. So I looked behind me on my bookshelf, and I found that I'd bought the book, read it cover to cover, and had forgotten that I'd read it. So I said, well, that's not very effective. And I said, one reason the book won't have much impact is it's not available on the web. So university students worldwide won't, be, won't encounter it, because unless it's a textbook and you can just go through it uh, week by week, most universities no longer assign you know, six supplemental books. There's one textbook, and then there's web stuff, or maybe sometimes there's only web stuff. And uh, since it's not on the web, engineers won't email it to each other. Uh, it usually requires a working system to get an idea across. So anyway, basically, um, 
What I didn't notice, what I didn't note is that any kind of technical book like this uh, probably has to be looked at several times, and it has to be wherever you are. So basically, you have to be able to get a piece of it wherever you are and look at it again. Um, and I said a book on usability that, because it isn't on the web and isn't organized as a full-term text, isn't usable. Um, so I think that's kind of an interesting thing. And actually, Raskin complained. He got all pissed off when he saw this review. So he sent me an email. And he said, I want you to look at the book again and edit your, like, edit your comment. I said, I'd be happy to, except I'm at home right now. And I own your book, but it's at my office. It's not on the web, so I can't look at it. <laughs> Um, so look at this, top 1,000 reviewer. Um, they had reader reviews starting five, six years ago. Um, a couple years ago, they started asking people, and Raskin's noted had all his friends come in here and like demoderate this down. Um, but basically, if you find a review helpful, let's find, let's moderate up one of the other reviews that calls him a pinhead. Outside the box isn't the same thing as good. All right, six out of eight people found that helpful. Let's make that nine. Oopers. You didn't say anything about the content. What's that? You didn't say anything about the content. It doesn't matter what the content of the book is. A book on usability cannot be understood in one reading, unlike a novel. And therefore, if it's not on the web, uh, people will forget what they read, put it aside, and they'll never get to it again. Whereas... Uh, is, that, is that Nielsen book in the book? No, and it also hasn't had much impact. Websites suck just as much as they used to. Whereas, uh, you know, what's that guy's name? Uh, the original Ur graphic designer on the web. Dave Siegel. So Siegel's ideas had a lot of impact because they were on the web where people could get to them. And uh, I have a feeling that a lot of the horizontal rules, every website used to have HR, 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 HR dividing every section. Because people thought, oh, if I divide these two sections, I'm going to use a horizontal rule. And that's what I did, too. And then I read Siegel's thing on the web. And uh, it said, uh, real designers use white space to separate things and headlines. Not, you know, you don't open up Time magazine and find that they've taken a magic marker. <laughs> <laughs> and trying to rule in between every article. So I'm like, hey, he's right. So I'll change my thing. Whereas I never read his book because, you know, I didn't feel like going to the bookstore, buying this book, reading it. I glanced through it sometimes, but I really, you know, it didn't hit me when I needed it. So I think engineering advice of that sort usually has to be available to people when they need it. Oh, so I forgot the, to show you the key thing. So the key thing here is I found that Enough people had voted for my reviews being good that I had reached the top 1,000 category. I saw that next to my name. I thought, wow, top 1,000, what does that mean? And then I looked and I found that I was at 900 something. And even though I'm not a huge Amazon fan, I thought, oh my god, most of my reviews are really old. I'm going to get pushed off this list. And I went back to my site and I cut and pasted every review that I had on my site into Amazon. And then I'm religious now about uh, I was in Bangkok, and I, well, you can see. <laughs> I was in India. Here's this book by a s science historian. I said it was thorough yet aimless, detailed yet unclear. Do you have any positive reviews in there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we go. Five stars for the moon Hancock to Bangkok. Five stars for uh, this. I think she's got a Pulitzer Prize, actually, Alison Lurie, so... Four stars for The Lecturer's Tale, which is this really savage book about English professors by a former lecturer, Red China Blues. So yeah, I've got mostly good ones. Four stars for Char Chuck Chucky Ferguson, who created Front Page. Well, he didn't create it. He had an MIT guy, a real MIT guy, create it. But uh, he's still a pretty interesting thinker. Anyway, 650. I'm now, I've clawed my way up to 650, <laughs> so I can relax a little bit. But they motivated me, even though they're not offering me anything other than recognition and a chance to sort of indulge my competitive nature. Um, that may be enough. So you ought to think about this. Breakout and... Do they subtract? I mean, how do they arrive at I that? believe it's just positive it's comments. Positive. Yeah. Whoever gets the most positive. But who knows? They may refine it, and then maybe Raskin will be able to... Maybe Raskin and... and Friends will be able to knock me down. <laughs> Another few points. Break out and reassemble. Um, 
So you could just be in the photo.net thread and you could say, okay, well, I'm not sure I want to respond to this yet. I want to talk to some other people first. You could start a new thread and let the moderators delete that after a day. Um, the problem with that is that you know it's a pretty heavyweight mechanism, a lot of web navigation, um, and it's going to get enshrined in the Oracle database. So maybe it would be better to have a button that would link you into an AOL instant messenger session. I now think that that's the right thing because almost everybody has uh, instant messenger clients on their desktops. So have a photo.net chat room continuously going in AIM. Growing gracefully. Um, you may have to deal with this in your system design. You probably won't have too many users um, immediately. How do you grow from? Uh, how do you grow to one or two million people? Because the sociologists will say that maybe you can't. Uh, one thing is to ask each user as they register for postal code and country. Then you can offer people connections with people who live near themselves. Then let's get to photo.net interesting person system. Um, have I ever told you about my debates with Eve about Caltech versus MIT? Okay. So if we were married, this would be a mixed marriage. Um, she say, maintains that Caltech is better than MIT. And I say, hey, Caltech's only a fifth the size of MIT. If you take this hot fifth of MIT, people there are much smarter than people at Caltech. And she says, well, think about Boston with three million people. There are more smart people in the Boston area than there are at MIT but it's hard to find them because they're separated by all these stupid people. Um, and that's what MIT is like. There are some people there who are as smart as people at Caltech, but there's mostly stupid people running around. <laughs> um, so I think that people have that same perspective. They have Eve's perspective when they go to a place like AOL or new photo.net. When photo.net started, it was all really good photographers. Now you go into the photo sharing system and, you know, there's a lot of uh, point-and-shoot snapshots that people posted there because they wanted to share them with their uh, friends or whatever, not because and they don't happen to be good photographers. So how do you deal with that? Well, if you run around the city of Boston, you sort of keep track on people that are interesting to you. They're called your friends, and you keep track of what they're saying and what they're doing. I had to see a list of my interesting people sorted, at least maybe the top, the top few should be the ones who sort to the top based on the recency of stuff they've contributed to photo.net. And then if I click, I ought to be able to get directly to their contributions. So even if there's a million people using the discussion forums, the people that I've identified are easy to track. Um, ditto in the photos in the gallery. I've often seen fabulous photos. So I, t I tell you that a lot of the photos in the PhotoDB systems aren't that good. But sometimes you see things that are fabulous. Let's see what's PhotoDB. That's not so fabulous. Always, I want to keep track of this photographer. I want to see anything else by Vink Voigt. Um, I think that could help. Geospatialized discussion. So this is something that environmental defense runs on scorecard.org. Um, you can look at this discussion, actually. You can see all the B-board postings in the traditional view. This is a different view of the same data model. So let's say you're a hardcore California environmentalist. You can look at, you can bookmark a page that will show you just the California discussion. So if you want, you can look at all the discussion nationwide if you're, you know, <coughs> somebody who works for the EPA or something. Otherwise, you can bookmark this page, stick to California someday, and so here, for example, is a question about the Chevron factory refinery in El Segundo. You can post a new question about Chevron, a new question about LA County, a new question about California, a new question about EPA Region 9. The discussion is anchored to this report of pollution at this factory, putting out you know, 747,000 pounds of air pollution 10 years ago and 
Now they're down to 673, not much of an improvement. So you can send them a fax right from the server, kind of fun. Um, can you get cancer maps? Uh, I don't know. I haven't kept track with all their data. They have pretty good data, more all the time. Anyway, what I wanted to show you is that the discussion becomes manageable because if you're only interested in California or, L or LA County, that's all you have to see. And that's, that becomes your little sub-community. So you can slice it and dice, slice and dice the discussion in different ways. All right, that's the end of the community <coughs> lecture. So a question or two or, about Oracle or about this stuff? So I'm just referring back to the, the slash dot, I mean, since that's one we're all acquainted with, or both of us. Yeah. I mean, it, the thing that you said that most struck me is this thing about the amount of expert content versus the amateur content. Mm -hmm. well, it used to be that you could read through it and filter it even without moderating, going a moderation filter and get some good knowledge. Now you have to read every damn. What do you mean? You can filter slash dot by score. Right, but I'm saying that used to be more effective than it is now because oh. the moderation system is. Well, you know, slash dot again, they've, they've scaled. Maybe they haven't scaled so gracefully. Um, they do have, uh, I mean, it's interesting. It's interesting how they do their magnet content, right? They actually do their magnet content without writing any. The magnet content for Slashdot is, here's this article that I've been reading, to, that I'm reading today in the New York Times. And now this is magnet content for the community, which is certainly a lot easier uh, way to do it than what we had to do at Photo.net. I'm not sure that's going to work for you guys, because <laughs> I have a feeling that you know, Slashdot may be a one-of-a-kind phenomenon. Uh, although perhaps you could do the same thing in a slightly different area. I guess you could become you know, the one news and discussion site, or one of a few news and discussion sites in some area of interest that was a little bit less nerdy than slash dots. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. I generally admire what they do. I mean, they'll probably dig themselves out of it, right? I'm sure they're gonna go through cycles where they come up with new software ideas that really work well, then the community will grow, and they'll have to come up with better ones. The experience will degrade, they'll have to come up with better ideas. I'm just happy it's not my site, I don't have to deal with them. Who else has a question? Okay, I guess we're done.